Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. What secrets do they reveal? We'll find out in this week's Watchman video broadcast. <laughs> This is Pastor Mike Hogger coming to you from Watchman Studios with another Watchman video broadcast. We're studying numbers and how they relate to Bible prophecy, how they reveal things that are going to happen in the future. And this week, this particular number pretty much reveals the final showdown between light and darkness good and bad, Christ and Antichrist, the true gospel and the fake other gospel that Paul warned about. So let's look at our first two verses that give us the direction from God to study these numbers. We start this, uh, each one of these talks out with these two verses. Revelation 13, 18, here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred three score and six. Notice he's telling wisdom comes from counting the number, and he gives the number. Then that same number is applied to the chapter divisions. Ecclesiastes chapter 7 is the 666th chapter of the Bible, written by Solomon, who said, I applied mine heart to know and to search and to seek out wisdom and the reason of things and to know the wickedness of folly, even of foolishness and madness. Uh, Solomon was seeking out wisdom. So he says two verses later in verse 27, Behold, this have I found, saith the preacher, counting one by one to find out the account. Again, we have two places in the Bible, one Old Testament, one New Testament. They are the two witnesses that tell us that wisdom and understanding come from counting numbers, counting one by one to find out the account. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath the understanding count the number. So let's count things in the Bible. And this week we're going to be dealing with, we've dealt with number one, two, three, four. And we always start out in the first book of the Bible in the creation week and in the Genesis chapters because so far, Numbers 1, 2, and 3, we've seen some pretty neat revelations uh, and number patterns in the creation week. I guess we would run out of the creation week stuff after the number 7. It's only seven days in the creation, right? Then we'll go out to other places when we get to number 8. But anyway, we're still in the creation week because on day 4, God did something that is related to what he did on day 1, of the creation. So let's go to Genesis chapter 1. We're going back to day one of creation and we're looking at, we know that God created light on that day, but look at the number of words that God used in this King James Bible to speak light into existence. Genesis chapter 1 verse 3, and God said, 1, 2, 3, 4, let there be light. And then four more words, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. God divided the light from the darkness. Notice that. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. In the evening and the morning were the first day. So let's break this down for a minute. We have the two overwhelming, this, this is what the Bible's all about, themes good and evil, light and darkness. We have Christ and the one who is 
the Lord of Darkness, I guess you could say, is the Antichrist. He is the opposite of everything that Jesus is. So then, the gospel of Jesus Christ, there is the opposite of that gospel, and it is another gospel. That's what the Apostle Paul warned us about. So, and, and what is the gospel? The gospel is man's means of salvation provided by God. God gives man the ability to overcome death in this world and his own death. So God give, gives man the means to leave this world and to live forever. Immortality. Now, I've studied the occult arts. I have read books. I've got a lot of books, a lot of materials. You can look at websites, YouTube videos, whatever, that deal with the occult, whether it's uh, secret societies, whether it's witchcraft, or any of the pagan religions. And there's one common theme, Manly Hall caught on to this, that in all the world's religions, there's one common theme. And that is the way to bring a man or a mortal and turn him into an immortal, going from death to life. Or a theme related to that would be how to bring or how to join heaven and earth together so that those on earth enjoy the benefits of those in heaven and hence, once again, immortality. So there is God's way of immortality, which he provides his only begotten son because of man's sins, we have death brought to us, but because of Jesus Christ, God's gift to us, we can have everlasting life. And it's a free gift. It is not given by any merit honor of our own. We do not earn it. We did not pay for it. We have not performed good works for it anything like that, it is a free gift. That to, that to me and, and those who believe the gospel, that's very clear. But there's a lot of religions in the world that their version of getting man into heaven, like with Islam or with, uh, well, I'll just stick with Islam. Islam says if you pray five times a day, if you go to Mecca, if you do this purification ceremony, if you never touch a pork thing, never defiled by anything like that, then you can achieve uh, heaven and paradise and eternal life, immortality, and I won't get into the rest of it because it's vulgar. But anyway, that's their version of heaven, but it requires a strict adherence to a set of rules that requires them to do certain things throughout their lifetime. Whereas God understands that us humans are not good at doing anything for a whole lifetime. We break the rules. We go against things that are told to us that this is normal, this is right, you shouldn't do this, you should do this. We go against those things and God knows it because he made us. So that's why God's version of the gospel is to give us salvation and immortality as a free gift paid for by his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. The devil's version of, of, or man's version of that always requires works out of man or requires a high status or it requires a large sum of money or it requires something that to almost all people in the world is an impossibility. So this is why as a, as a man, as a person, as a gospel preacher, I hate other gospels. I hate them because there's a lot of people then that are never going to qualify and adhere to those strict rules in these other religions, whereas God's version is a free gift. So when you're dealing with the number four, you're looking at as evidence here on the first day of creation. God gives us light and then there's darkness and God divides the two. And so in those two divisions, one of those is always going to be bad. You have the Antichrist, you have Satan, you have Babylon the Great, you have a false gospel that requires works or adherence or you know, money or whatever it is. 
And then here you have the good guys. You have Jesus Christ. You have the apostles. You have the word of God. You have the gospel of Jesus Christ and that free gift of salvation that knows that we cannot merit and, justif and be justified by our own deeds and by our own actions. So God, out of pure love, gives that to all mankind, even though most mankind is going to reject it. And that's the theme that we have when God said, let there be light. Now, to me, all of a sudden there's light. So what is the source of that light? Because as of day one, there was no sun, there was no moon, there was no stars. There was no flashlight or torch, the way you British people say. Um, so what was the source of that light? Well, it appears that the source of the light was the words that God said, let there be light, and there was light. The true source of light is the word of God. All right, so now let's jump to uh, the fourth book of the New Testament. We have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and there's something about all, if you don't know anything about the Bible, there's something about all four of those books that I just mentioned, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They are what we call the four Gospels. They all four tell a similar but unique story of the birth, the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ and what his life here was all about. When we look in the fourth Gospel account, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, so that would be John, we find something very interesting related to what we just saw in Genesis 1 on the first day of creation where God said four words, let there be light. John chapter 1, verse 6, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light. Notice that it's capital L. I didn't do that. That was in the King James translation. That all men through him might believe. He was not that light, capital L once again, but was sent to bear witness of that light, capital L, that was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. We have four different occurrences of the word light. It is the only place where the word light, with the capital L, is capitalized to show deity. The word light itself, with a capital L, is only mentioned five times in the King James Bible. The fifth time or the other time other than what we see in John chapter 1 it's like at the beginning of a sentence so this is the only place in the whole Bible where the word light is given a capital L to show that that light is a reference to deity or God in this case it would be Jesus Christ himself and Jesus we find out from John 1 1 is the word Remember what happened in Genesis 1. Let there be light. It was the spoken word of God, which is also Jesus Christ, who is also God, that brings light into the world. And in this case, John spells it out. He is the light of this world. In fact, the word light itself, just in the fourth gospel, which is the book of John, is mentioned exactly 24 times, and that is a multiple of four times six. So now let's go back to Genesis chapter one and look at the fourth day of creation. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. Notice we have that division again, day and night, light and darkness, and let them be for, notice this, signs, and for seasons, and for days, and years. Notice that on this particular day of creation, we have let there be lights in the firmament, and it's these lights are for signs, and seasons, and days, and years. Four things. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth, and it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of, he of the heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good and the evening and the morning 
were the fourth day. So, day one of creation, God says four words, and there is light. John chapter 1, the fourth gospel, we have the word light mentioned in reference to Jesus Christ, who is God, deity, with a capital L, it's mentioned four times. So then we go back to the fourth day of creation, and we find now that God is going to give a visible source of that light. He creates the sun to rule over the day. That's the greater light that rules over the day. The moon and the stars are the lesser light to rule over the night. So in all of this, we see how the number four relates to light. And because we know that we're dealing with light of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the light that lights men's eyes so they can see their sin, so they can see who God is, so they can see that Jesus really is the only way to salvation. So the number four and light itself is going to be a reference to the gospel. But let's kind of keep this division going here. Because as we move through the scriptures and we look at things that are related to the number four, we're going to see a clear difference between the good guys and the bad guys. On the good guys side, you have light, you have Jesus, you have the gospels, which bring light to mankind, save men's souls, and you have the gospel itself. Then on the dark side, you have Darth Vader, and no, on the dark side, you have darkness. You have a lesser light that rules over darkness. You have evil, you have all the bad guys, Satan and the Antichrist and his kingdom. Think about that. And then his way of bringing immortality to the flesh of man, which is not good. So that's another gospel that Paul warned us about. Not the true gospel, it's a alternative gospel, another gospel, and Paul said, which is not another gospel. In other words, it's not really good news. It's bad news because it's going to bring, it's not going to bring a blessing, it's going to bring a curse. So things related to the number four deal with light or darkness, deal with Christ's kingdom or the kingdom of the Antichrist, Christ and the Antichrist, God and Satan, good and bad, light and darkness, day and night, the true gospel, and a false gospel. That's what we're going to see as we're looking into this number four. So, he creates on day four the things, the, the lights that are in the heavens that, that are for signs, seasons, days, and years. And I want you to stop and think about this for a minute. We measure time on this earth by means of the heavenly lights. We measure months by way of the moon. Incidentally, a woman's cycle not only matches perfectly the lunar cycle. You have a, a waxing, it going from darkness, getting brighter and brighter and brighter, and then it's a full moon then it's waning period and that woman's cycle does the exact same thing it waxes greater and greater and greater until such a time as you know and then it wanes away and it lasts about 28 days or just a little bit more than that and that's the exact same in fact a woman's cycle is named after the moon okay the measurement of time based upon the heavenly objects. The measurement of months based upon the position of the stars on any given night. So there are 12 divisions of those and we have 12 months. The counting of the hours of the day have everything to do with the rising and the setting of the sun which God set in motion, and it just so happens that there are 24 hours in every day, uh, 30 days in every month, that goes along with the stellar objects, the stars that are in the sky, and we measure those. Be before, before we had phones and watches and clocks on the wall, 
People used the stars to gauge the months, the sun to gauge the hours of the day, but they used all of these things that God put in the skies for signs, for seasons, for days, and for years. Because it all, the sun and the moon and the stars, and it all goes in circuits. And those circuits, we can count the number of days and the number of hours that it takes to go in one circuit. We just, we, mankind has figured this out before computers ever came about. All right? So then, so we have these objects, these signs, seasons, days, and years objects that measure time out for us and gives us seasons and gives us times and so on. Uh, we have the sun, which is the greater light that rules over the day. We have the moon and the stars, which is the lesser light that rules over the night. We have the word sun, S-U-N, in the King James Bible mentioned exactly 160 times, which is, take a look at the screen, 40 times 4. Isn't that interesting? And notice these verses here where... It tells us who the sun represents. Psalm 84, 11, For the Lord God is a sun and shield. Let me stop right here. The Lord God is a sun and a shield. Here's what we know about the sun. The sun is huge, and the sun has a lot of gravity to it. And those who are a lot smarter than me, astrophysicists and so on, uh, have figured out that the reason why, or one of the reasons why Earth isn't constantly being bombarded with all of these meteorites and rocks floating through space and so on is because the sun's gravity either pulls them into orbit or pulls them into the sun and they go crashing into the sun instead of coming crashing in the Earth. In other words, literally, literally, the sun is a shield to the earth. And look at your Bible. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. Malachi 4.2, but unto you that fear my name shall the sun of righteousness. Look at that, it gets capitalized. So we know it's talking about the Lord Jesus. The son of righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. Jeremiah 31, 35, Thus saith the Lord, which giveth the sun for a light by day, so that would be Jesus, and the ordinances of the moon and the stars for a light by night, which divideth the sea when the waves thereof roar, the Lord of hosts is his name. Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. John called him that true light, capital L. So think of the sun as a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ, the greater light that rules over the day. You know, the moon and the stars, they don't just disappear and are not there during the daytime. What happens? When the sun comes out, because the sun is shining so much brighter than the moon and the stars, the moon and the stars are still there. We can't see them because the sun is shining far brighter. You know, it's like somebody shining a flashlight in your eyes. When they do that, you literally can't see anything else except that light, that sunlight. Let me tell you, those of us who know Jesus and who know the Word of God, to those of us whom the sun shines on us, we just can't see any other way. And I'm fine with that. I really am. I'm fine because there's nothing about Jesus that's ever done me any harm in this world, I can tell you that. But notice all the connections between the sun and the Lord Jesus Christ. So that sun represents the gospel that lights every man that comes into the world. God wants mankind to know his love for them. So let's go to the fourth chapter of the Bible. So on day one, we have the four words, let there be light. On day four, we have God created the lights for the signs, the seasons, the days, and the years. The greater light to rule over the day, the sun, the lesser light to rule over the night, the moon, 
and then of course the stars. And remember that division, light and darkness, good and bad, Christ and Antichrist, God and Satan, heaven and hell, true gospel, false gospel. So when we go to the fourth chapter of the Bible, that's the theme that we see in there. Because we have a story of two men, Cain and Abel. And in Genesis 4, we have a preview or a foreshadowing. It's kind of like you go to the movies and before you watch the movie you paid to see, you get to watch a preview of five other movies that they want you to see, right? Well, that's what a lot of typology is. It's a preview of things that come later on. And it's meant to get us to go, ooh, I don't want to miss that. So let's read Genesis 4 that way. Genesis 4, verse 8, Cain talked with Abel, his brother. So stop right here. We have the two people, Cain and Abel. So it doesn't take a whole lot to figure out who's who here. Cain's the bad guy. Abel's the good guy. Abel didn't do anything wrong. In fact, God accepted Abel's what? Sacrifice. Out of all the sacrifices all throughout the Bible, Whose sacrifice did God accept for man's salvation? Jesus, right? But God rejected Cain and his sacrifice. So think about this. The greater light is the one whom God accepts his sacrifice. The lesser light, the rulers of the darkness of this world, God has rejected their way. Think about it. So Cain, now that he sees that God is accepting Abel's sacrifice and rejecting his, Cain's not, he's not down with that. Mm -mm, he does not like that at all. So look at what it says. And Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. Now Hebrews 11.4 tells us what this story is really all about. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. Stop right here. Because, remember, the real gospel has to do with Christ giving us salvation as a free gift, and that gospel is God's grace manifested to us by our faith. So, how is it that Abel's sacrifice was accepted by God? It was because Abel did it by faith. Cain is a picture then of those who just perform the motions and go through the motions and perform the ritual or pay the money or do the works. But they, don't, they don't have faith. They don't really believe it. And God won't accept it. So you see that now? You see that in the gospel? By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it, he being dead, yet speaketh. Now notice what the Bible, New Testament, again, John looks back to Cain, in 1 John 3, 12, it says, not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, meaning Satan, and slew his brother, and wherefore slew he him, or why did he slay him? Because his own works were evil and his brother's righteous. You see it? So God said, let there be light. And there was light. God divided the light from darkness. The light is the gospel. The light is Jesus Christ. The light is the word of God. The light is God. The light is the sun. You have the darkness. That is Satan, Antichrist. That Cain is of that wicked one. See, God is telling you in the New Testament the, the two sides here in Genesis 4. Abel is the good guy on the good side team. Cain is the bad guy on the bad guy's team. He's in darkness. He has a gospel that is, does not involve faith. It's trying to get man to live forever, but rejecting God's plan by faith. Okay, you see that now? That's right there in Genesis 4. The whole gospel story previewed right there for us in Genesis chapter 4. Let's go back to Hebrews 12. We find that Jesus is the mediator of the new covenant and to the blood of sprinkling 
that speaketh better things than that of Abel. Now go to that previous verse in Hebrews 11. By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. What is it about Abel that still speaking? It was his blood. And so in Hebrews 12, Jesus the mediator of the new covenant and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. So we have Abel whose blood still speaks because God told Cain, he said, you know, you killed your brother. His blood still cries out to me from the ground. It's Abel's blood that speaketh. That was his testimony. But Jesus Christ, who was righteous, his blood speaks better things than that of Abel. Yeah, there it is. Genesis 4.10, he said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. So notice that we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four gospel testimonies of the birth, the life, the death, and the resurrection. Four things in the four gospels. The birth, the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, all four of them speak the same story, but in a unique way. Now notice these red circles with these letters, O-A-B-A-B. -A -B. Do you know what that is? Those are blood types. Some people are A, some people are B, I'm a B positive. Some are AB and some are O. Now, isn't it interesting that the gospel speaks of the blood? There are four gospels. There are four blood types. We have the four gospel stories, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are the synoptic gospels. Their stories match in many ways. It's almost the same outline, almost the same stories, almost the same words used in every one. John's gospel is different than the other three. If you were to take a look at these four blood types, O, A, B, and A, B, which one of these blood types would you say is different than the other three? I would pick O because in the O blood group, you have the universal donor. In other words, Christ's blood when it was shed for the sins of mankind, wasn't just shed for a certain group of people like the Jews. Christ's blood, John 3.16, John's the fourth gospel, John 3.16 said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And so rather than Christ's blood being offered just for a certain limited group of people, Christ's blood offers atonement for all types of people. In other words, if you're dying and you're running out of blood, and if they don't, if they don't get blood in you in the next five minutes, you're going to be dead. And they don't have time to match your blood type. They're going to go grab a bottle of, I think it's O negative, maybe, Anyway, the universal donor, O, they're going to grab that because they know that blood will cover it all. I love it. I love, I love this number. It's one of my favorites. So in these four Gospels, you have this account. Matthew 27, 35, they crucified him, parted his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, they parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. Mark 15, 24, when they had crucified him, they parted his garments, casting lots upon them, what every man should take. Luke 23, 23, and they were instant with loud voices, requiring that he might be crucified. And the voices of them and of the chief priests prevailed. John 19, 23, then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to every soldier a part and also his coat now the coat was without seam woven from the top throughout and, that, and I just picked these verses because each one of them 
from each of the four Gospels tells you the story of the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ. And in his death, it was his blood being offered for the atonement of our sins. Think of it like this. We know from Revelation uh, 21, I think, or 22, that there is a book for every human being that's ever lived. And that book contains all their dirty deeds. Every dirty action, every sinful action, every lustful thought, everything you coveted after, everything you said, everything you did, everything you saw, all your sins are listed, just like a prosecutor who would have your rap sheet and the list of charges against you. There is a book in heaven where they write down all your sins. So when you get to heaven, they're going to read these things off of everything you did. Unless what has been written in that book suddenly has been taken off so that it was like it was never there. That's what happens when the blood of Jesus Christ goes to blot out our transgressions. That's what the Bible says. It is blotted out our transgressions from the book where they were written in. So we have this life that we've done all these things wrong and we regret it, but there's nothing we can do about it because, you know, when they catch somebody, a lot of times they feel bad for what they did. But the fact is they did it and there's no going back. And now they have to serve the consequences for it. We may feel bad for things we did, but we can't take them off the book. We did it. Except the blood be applied in blotting out our transgressions so that when those who are saved get to heaven, they open the book. So a book is open. It's supposed to have all of our bad stuff written in it. And there's nothing there. And so now it is as if we are just as righteous as God's only begotten Son is. See, I love the real gospel because the real gospel gives that gift to anybody in the world free of charge. God not requiring us to keep the law, God not requiring us to pay money, God not requiring us to belong to any particular church and denomination. He just says, I'll give it to you as a free gift if you'll trust what I say in my word. Mm -mm -mm. So now, let's look at this gospel and its relation to the number four and take it one more step to this number four pointing in a particular direction. Let me show you what I mean. Notice it says in Acts chapter 1, verses 8, this is after the four Gospels. Jesus said, But ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem, that's number 1, and in all Judea, that's number 2, and in Samaria, that's number 3, and unto the uttermost part of the earth, that's number 4. Notice that the four Gospels, the story of the birth, the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, Jesus predicted that his disciples, in fact, he, he didn't so much predict it as he commanded it, go and tell everybody, ye shall be witnesses unto me into Jerusalem. And sure enough, that's when the Holy Ghost came down, they were all in Jerusalem. Then in Judea, and so what happened? They were in Jerusalem, people were being saved, church built, being built, but persecution came and scattered and moved them out of Jerusalem. Now they go into Judea, but they go everywhere preaching the gospel. Then from Judea, they go to Samaria. Samaria is like, if you remember, the nation of Israel was divided, and it was Jerusalem to the south and Samaria to the north. So they go from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria, to where the ten northern tribes were, because they were scattered out there by persecution. And then from Samaria, the uttermost part of the earth. One, two, three, four places that the gospel goes. Let's take that and go back to the Old Testament. Let's look at a promise given to Abram 
This is before he is Abraham, a promise given to Abram about a blessing that was going to come to him and a land that was going to be given to him. Genesis 13, 14, And the Lord said unto Abram, After that lot was separated from him, Lift up now thine eyes and look from the place where thou art, number one, northward, number two, southward, number three, eastward, and number four, westward. Now let's stop right here. How far is north? Well, it just keeps going. How far is east? It keeps going. West? How far is south? It keeps going. He's telling him to look in these four directions, and technically, you know, Jesus, God said, as far as the east is from the west, that's how far are scattered your transgressions. How far is that? Well, they never meet, okay? Except where you are, they, they just keep going out and out and out to infinity. And I think in this, what God is showing Abraham or Abram at this time is, I'm giving you so much. In fact, I'm giving you the entire creation, northward, southward, eastward, and westward. And how did Abram get that? The Bible says, by faith. Abram received righteousness. He believed God, and God imputed righteousness. And in other words, here's Abram's book of all of his sins that he's done. But Abram believed God. So what did God do? He blotted out all of Abram's transgressions. He imputed righteousness to him so that there is no transgressions in his book that can be charged against him. And that promise is given to all who accept the gospel by faith. Like, uh, like Abram did. Like Abel did and others in Hebrews 11. So then let's look at this. Let's trace this lineage here. We have Abraham. We have his son Isaac, that's number two. We have Jacob, and Jacob had Leah, Rachel, Bilah, and Zilpah. He had four women. From the, and you can read about this in Genesis. From those four women came the 12 tribes. Think about it. The 12 tribes that God made a promise to were born of four. Think about it. Think about those four representing Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. When we are saved, we're, we're born literally of the gospel. We're born again by way of the gospel. Mm. So then we have Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Jacob, his four wives, Leah, Rachel, Bill, and Zilpah, give birth to the 12 tribes. That's the fourth generation from Abraham. And the fourth born from those 12 tribes, we have Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah. So follow this. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, 12 tribes. 12 tribes were the fourth generation. And in the 12 tribes, the fourth born, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, and Christ was a high priest of God, but not from the third tribe, Levi. From the fourth tribe born, Judah. Doesn't it make sense? Judah is the fourth child of Jacob from his four wives. Judah's the fourth child, and that happens to be the exact lineage that Jesus comes from. So he, as a high priest, acts the high priest office in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, four books. It, it just matches. It just makes the Bible more perfect than you ever thought it ever was. All right? So let's take that now, and let's take this number four, and let's understand it from a higher vantage point. There are things down here below, like humans and animals and plants, but we also know in heaven, there are creatures up there that God made. We call them angels. They're cherubs, seraphs, angels that look like men. Okay, So let's look at that 
in relation to the gospel. I'm going to try to tie it together here in a little bit. Ezekiel chapter 1 verse 5, Also out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures. And this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man. In verse 22, In the likeness of the firmament upon the heads of the living creature was as the color of the terrible crystal stretched forth over their heads above, in verse 26, and above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne as the appearance of a sapphire stone, and upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness as the appearance of a man above upon it. What we're seeing here, because if you, and I didn't include all the verses in Ezekiel chapter 1, but what you're seeing here is the chariot that God's throne comes in on. Ezekiel says he sees this coming out of one of the directions, and it's the north. The north in the Bible, one of the four directions, always seems to be where the spiritual forces or the spiritual entities come from. They come from out of the north. Joel's army, guess what direction it comes from? The north. That's right. Okay? So we have... These, these four living creatures, they have wheels, within wheels. It's a little weird to think about that, but that's what they are. So they had these, these, had these four living creatures, and they have wheels built into their bodies, and above their heads is a, like a sea of glass, and it's the firmament, and then they have God sitting on his throne on top of that. The Bible says the chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of angels. And what you're seeing here in Ezekiel chapter 1 with these four living creatures, John calls them four beasts in Revelation 4, you're seeing here the chariot of God. You're seeing when God comes to present himself to Ezekiel, he came riding his chariot. Think about uh, back in the old days. The new version of this now would be like the presidential limousine or the Pope mobile. All right? Back in the old days, it didn't do for the king or the pharaoh or the emperor to walk around on the dirt like a man would. He has to be carried on high. So practically every king, every emperor, every pharaoh, they all had a similar version of this. Men would carry on poles the throne that Pharaoh would come riding in. And the, and the imagery here is that Pharaoh is high and lifted up above everybody else. Literally, he is sort of joining heaven and earth together. That's what that imagery is all about. Where'd they steal that from? They got it. They stole it from God. So let's look at, so we have God riding on this chariot, the firmament, and the four angels underneath it that are bearing this firmament, they're carrying it around, and their wheels go, and they go northward, or they go in all the different directions, all right? And when God told Moses to build the tabernacle, he said, I'm going to show you what it looks like up here, and then I want you to build it exactly the way you saw it. So when Moses then starts building the tabernacle, and he starts building like the candlestick and the table of showbread and the altar. He builds the Ark of the Covenant, which is the throne of God. There was an earthly ark that represented the seat that God sat on, God's mercy seat. And so Ezekiel 25 gives us the description of how that ark was made and how it was transported from one place to the next. They shall make an ark of shittim wood, which is like acacia or thorn wood, Two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof, and a cubit and a half the height thereof. And thou shalt overlay it with pure gold. Within and without shalt thou overlay it, and shalt make upon it a crown of gold round about. And thou shalt cast four rings of gold. Notice four rings for it. Because I'm going to show you something in a minute. And put them in the four corners thereof, and two rings shall be in the one side of it, and two rings in the other side of it. Now, don't you... Stop right here and get this. You have the ark, and it's like a rectangle gold box. And on each corner, there's a ring. And those rings are for a reason. There are two 
staves. Look at verse 13. Thou shalt make staves of shittim wood, which is acacia, which is thorn tree wood, and overlaying them with gold. And thou shalt put the staves into the rings by the sides of the ark, that the ark may be born with them. The staves shall be in the rings of the ark. Thou shalt not be taken from it, or they shall not be taken from it. So inside the ark, remember this, inside the ark was the book of the law. Now watch this. Get this picture. You have the ark, which is the throne of God, the earthly representation of God's throne. Four rings. And in those four rings, two staves, two sticks, two rods, two poles. The poles themselves are made of shittim wood or acacia or thorn tree overlaid with gold. The two rods going in the four rings and they are carrying one particular very important item. And that is the Word of God. And what is the Word of God? It is both the book of God's words and it is also Jesus Christ. And there is not a speck of difference between them. Jesus is the book of God's words the Word of God and the book of God's words, the Word of God is Jesus, the Word of God. I love, you know what? I, hang, on, hang on one second here. Yeah, I noticed that the word light in uh, John chapter 1 was mentioned four times, capital L. Um, we also have, let's see, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And there is one more occurrence of the Word of, in verse 14, and the Word, capital W, was made flesh and dwelt among us. I knew it. Three times the word Word, capital W, is mentioned in verse 1, and then the fourth time is in verse 14, capital W again, and it says the Word was made flesh. Now get this image in your mind. I love this. You have the two staves and the four rings and those carry and transport and move around and contain the book that Moses wrote. The, bo the, the book that Moses wrote with 22 Hebrew letters. Alright? You got it? Now take a look at this. Here's DNA. The two staves, notice the two staves, the four Levite priests, because those four Levite priests represent the four cherubs that carry the throne of God. The two staves are the two ladder legs of DNA. The four rings are the four base pairs, adenine, guanine, thymine, and cytosine. And those two staves and those four rings are where the book of the Lord is contained in. Your DNA code, which David said was a book where all your members were written in. Psalm 139, 16. Woo! Isn't it beautiful? And see that, if you look at both of these pictures here, you're also looking at the whole of the Bible. The two staves are the Old and New Testament. The four rings, because the four rings are what joins all of these guys and this whole thing together. Those four rings are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And inside those four rings is contained the Word of God. And in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, that's where Jesus, the Word, shows up. And he's the Word in the fourth book of the Gospels. Whew. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, understand this. When God said those two staves, once you put them in those four rings, they're never to come out, ever. God meant that. Because God meant it that that Ark of the Covenant was never to be carried and delivered somewhere else 
by any other means than those four Levite priests, which match those four living creatures that Ezekiel saw, that John saw, which match the four base pairs, which match the four Gospels. Now, can you think of a story where they tried to move the Ark of the Covenant without using four Levite priests bearing those two staves in those four rings with that book in it. Can you think of a story where that was done? How did that work? Let's look at it. 2 Samuel chapter 6. See, David wanted to bring the Ark to Jerusalem because he had a zeal. He wanted to build a house to God. I mean, I get that. Boy, did he get in trouble. Because he tried, listen to this, some other way than using the four Levite priests carrying the two staves and the four rings. 2 Samuel 6, 3, And they set the ark of God upon a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab that was in Gibeah. And Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, drave the new cart. And when they came to Nacon's threshing floor, Uzzah put forth his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen shook it. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God smote him there for his error, and there he died by the ark of God. And David was displeased because the Lord had made a breach upon Uzzah, and he called the name of the place Perez Uzzah to this day. See that? God is the one who said, this is the way and the only way that my word, my book, my DNA, my gospel can be carried and delivered. Only one way. For, and so later on, David finally brought the Ark of the Covenant the right ways using Levite priests. And then they're blowing trumpets and shouting. Guess what that's a picture of? Okay? The, the rapture, the translation. Anyway, when you try, when you think that you can deliver the gospel to people some other way than how God specified, you're not going to bring life to people. You're going to bring nothing but death and God's wrath down upon them. Notice this. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 4, Paul mentions another gospel. Galatians chapter 1, verse 6, he also mentions another gospel. I have it underlined. Galatians 1, 8, any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached, let it unto you, let him be accursed. And then in the next verse, as we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. What you're looking at in the whole of the Bible are the four places where the Bible teaches us about another gospel or any other gospel. Remember, we said that on day one of creation, God spoke four words, divided the light from the darkness. So the number four relates to the good guys and the gospel and the bad guys and their false gospel, their other gospel. And on day four of creation, the greater light ruling over the day and the lesser light rule over the night. We know that there are principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness of this world and spiritual wickedness in high places. So we have the good guys and the bad guys. And as we have four gospel records in our Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, so also we have a warning four times in the Bible against following some other way. God designed that four Levite priests carry the Ark of the Covenant and no other way. You can't, I don't care, but it was a new cart. I mean, they honored God by a, a brand new cart. They didn't just get some old cart. They had a new cart. I don't care. I don't care if they overlaid it with gold and put pearls all over it and had ladies throwing rose petals in its way so it never touched the ground. That wasn't the way that God specified that his gospel go forth. Okay? No other, see, that seat is God's mercy seat. And there is only one way to present God's mercy to mankind, and that is by way of Matthew, Mark, 
Luke, and John. Only one way. So, what we've seen so far, you have Cain, you have Abel, you have light, you have darkness, you have the good guys, you have the bad guys, you have the true gospel. Now, can man think of a million ways that he thinks a man can attain immortality? Yeah. So let's say there are a million different ways that mankind has cooked up to achieve immortality. And yet, out of all one million of those, 999,999 things are the wrong way. There's only one right way. Only one true gospel for all mankind, past, present, future. Some say, well, in the Old Testament, they didn't have Jesus and, you know, Jesus, you know, birth, life, death, and resurrection, and so they were saved another way. No, 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 no. Remember, you got two staves. They're carrying the same ark through the four rings. You have two strands of DNA, the two rungs, they're all joined together by what's in the middle. And what's in the middle are the four base pairs, just like the four Gospels joining the Old and the New Testament together. So it doesn't matter when they lived. Abraham died in faith. Moses died in faith. David died in faith. Sarah died in faith. All of these people, uh, Enoch, Abel, all of these people died in faith. And faith is what the gospel is all about. Will you believe what God said? So I'll just ask you, since I'm talking about the gospel, I, I'm going to ask you this question. Do you believe what God said? You believe God's word? Do you believe that Christ died for your sins, rose again on the third day, and he stands at God's right hand, and when you pray to God, you can't just pray directly to God because God will not hear you. You are full of sin. You must go through the mediator, Jesus Christ the righteous. Call upon the name of the Lord. God said you shall be saved. Will you do that today? Will you call upon the name of the Lord and say, God, I, I, I'm on the internet too much. I'm gossiping about people. I'm tearing people down with my words. I, I'm looking at things on the internet I shouldn't look at. I'm, I'm being a part of things I shouldn't be a part of. God, my life is full of sin and it's scaring me because I don't want to go to hell. I don't want to be delighted or divided from the light and be cast into outer darkness. I don't want that. God, will you save me and bring me out of darkness into your light? You call upon the Lord, I believe God will do that for you. All right? There's a lot more with this. It's number four, how it relates to prophecy. Because remember, we have Christ's kingdom, there's another kingdom. Okay. So you think about that and its relation to the number four. And we'll continue this and finish it up next week. This is Pastor Mike. I love you. You're the reason why I do what I do. Because God loves you. And he wants you to hear the truth of his word. All right? We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.